think all fuel-to-air ratios are created equal. Think again. Welcome to Einstein Motors, where we break down the results and science of all things automotive so you don't have to. Today, we're doing a deep dive into fuel stoichiometry and ideal power ratios. Specifically for gasoline and methanol, we'll be looking at information that outlines the fundamental differences in their ideal combustion requirements mm -hmm. and a text discussing the properties of methanol as a fuel. Mm -hmm. um, the goal here is to really try to suss out what are some of the key differences between these two fuels and uh -huh. why those differences matter when it comes to engine performance and efficiency. Easy. So let's get right to it. What immediately jumps out when we look at the fundamentals is that gasoline and methanol have vastly different appetites for air. You can say that again. Our sources lay out these stoichiometric ratios uh, for complete combustion. So for every one part methanol, you need 6.47 parts air. Okay. But gasoline requires 14.7 parts air for every single part of fuel. Wow. Big difference there. Yeah. So right off the bat, we see that methanol needs significantly less air for a complete burn, but... The story doesn't end with complete combustion, does it? It does not, no. We also have these power ratios, the mixtures that give us the most grunt. What do those look like? Well, for methanol, yeah. you're looking at an air-fuel ratio of 5.5 to 5.8 to 1. Gasoline, on the other hand, sits around 12.7 to 13 to 1. Okay, so yeah. again, methanol's ideal power mixture is still considerably richer in fuel yeah. than gasoline. What does that tell us? What really reinforces this idea that Methanol and gasoline are fundamentally different in their combustion needs. Right. So what makes methanol so unique? Well, if we connect this back to the underlying chemistry and physics, methanol possesses several inherent advantages when it comes to combustion. One key factor is its laminar burning velocity. This is basically how quickly the flame spreads through the combustion chamber. Oh. Methanol burns much faster than gasoline, I and that means more efficient energy extraction. And he could even allow for more aggressive engine timing yeah, to boost power without encountering knock. More efficient power? Yeah. Sounds like a plus. Are there other combustion characteristics where methanol shines? Another one is the combustion temperature. Okay. Methanol burns much cooler than gasoline. And so what does that mean? I don't know. What does that mean? It means it produces less not shoss emissions. Oh, okay. So Nitrogen oxides. Yeah. Right. Those harmful emissions that we're always trying to reduce. Right. That makes sense. So methanol naturally. Uh-huh produces less of those pollutants. Okay, and then? And then furthermore, if we look at its molecular structure, just one carbon atom, no carb carbon bonds. Mm -hmm. This means that methanol combustion produces virtually no soot. Soot, that's a huge environmental advantage. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I recall reading something about harnessing waste heat to make methanol even more efficient. Yeah, this is what's called onboard methanol reforming. Imagine this capturing the low-grade heat yeah. from the exhaust right. and using it to convert methanol into a mixture hmm. rich in hydrogen. This reformed fuel actually has a higher energy content oh, wow. than the original methanol. So Yo. by feeding this hydrogen-enriched fuel back into the engine, you're essentially getting more bang for your buck Yeah, and boosting overall system efficiency. Right. It's a clever way to leverage otherwise lost energy. That's amazing. Yeah. Um. But our text also mentions some concerns regarding methanol's toxicity. Right, and its tendency to be corrosive. Yeah. How significant are these drawbacks? Well, while methanol is indeed toxic, the data shows that its levels are comparable to gasoline and diesel. Okay. And in some cases, yeah. even better. Really? So maybe the toxicity is managed? As long as you follow. Safe handling practices, of course. Right, of course. But the corrosiveness seems like a more inherent property. That's where the real challenges come in. Methanol can be quite aggressive towards certain materials. Uh -huh. So you need to pay very close attention to material selection when designing methanol-fueled engines. I see. So given these properties, where does methanol typically find its niche? Well, it's Hyron. Yeah. Makes it excellent for spark-ignited engines. Okay. What about compression ignition? Yeah, it can be used in those too. Using concept called dual fuel operation. Dual fuel? How does that work? There's a couple of ways to do it. You could directly inject methanol into the cylinder with a small amount of diesel to act as a pilot, right. or you could introduce the methanol into the intake manifold and allow it to mix with the incoming air. Then the regular diesel injection ignites the mixture. Interesting. I read that one of these dual fuel methods mm. is more economical. Yeah, port fuel injection, Yeah. or PFI. PFI. Yeah, where methanol sprayed into the intake path. Yeah. Tends to be more cost effective. Okay. 
Are there any trade-offs or challenges associated with using PFI with methanol? Well, when the liquid methanol evaporates, it does two things. Yep. It displaces some of the incoming air. Okay. And it cools down the air-fuel mixture. So right. with gasoline, these two effects tend to roughly balance each other out. Right. But methanol behaves differently. Methanol has a much higher latent heat of vaporization. Meaning? It needs a lot more energy to change from liquid to vapor, mm. about three times as much as gasoline. Mm. It also has a much lower uh, stoichiometric air requirement, less than half of gasoline. So for the same excess air ratio, methanol needs considerably more heat to fully vaporize. Wow. Does our information give us any insight into the extent of this vaporization in typical PFI systems? Well, research indicates that methanol is often not fully vaporized. Okay. Even if it's not fully vaporized, what are the implications of that? In dual fuel operations, it can lead to increased emissions. Okay. Of carbon monoxide and unburned hydrocarbon. It can also extend the ignition delay of the pilot diesel fuel and lead to less efficient combustion. Yep. But in spark ignited engines, this cooler intake charge can actually be beneficial. Oh, how so? It increases the engine's resistance to knock by slowing down the combustion of the end gas. Some studies suggest that with low enough intake temperatures achieved through methanol evaporation, knock-free operation is possible even at high compression ratios. That's incredible. So it sounds like accurately predicting how much methanol evaporates is critical for optimizing performance. Right, and minimizing unwanted emissions. Yeah. Our text touches on the complexities of modeling this process. To truly optimize these engines, we need reliable models that can predict the temperature right. of the air-fuel mixture after methanol injection. In the intake port, this requires a deep understanding of both droplet evaporation and film evaporation. So our source material also mentions how boosting an engine affects the ideal power ratios. Yeah, you span on that. When you boost an engine, you're forcing more air into the cylinders. To maintain optimal combustion, boosted engines typically require a richer air-fuel mixture. So for a naturally aspirated gasoline engine with a power ratio around 13 to 1, a boosted version might need a ratio closer to 12.5 to 1 or even richer. Exactly. And the same principle applies to methanol. Okay. So to recap, we've looked at the differences in stoichiometric and power ratios between gasoline and methanol, we've seen that methanol consistently requires richer mixtures. We've explored methanol's unique combustion properties and its potential advantages, as well as the practical considerations of toxicity and corrosiveness. We even discussed its applications in spark ignited and dual fuel engines. And finally, we touched upon how engine boosting necessitates further enrichment of the ideal fuel ratios. It just goes to show choosing the right fuel and understanding its needs is a lot more complex than many people think. Couldn't agree more. For more technical breakdowns and our handy automotive calculators, be sure to follow Einstein Motors on our socials or visit EinsteinMotors.com.au. So, as we move toward a future with evolving fuel technologies, how will a deeper understanding of these fundamental fuel-air relationships pave the way for the next generation of high-performance and efficient engines? Thanks for tuning in.